Listen. This episode of NVC is brought to you by Monopoly Madness. Hello again, Super Nintendos. It is episode 592 of Nintendo Voice Chat. I am joined today by Brian Altano, straight from the Disney Vault. I'm back, unfrozen from time. Here we are. <laughs> Pear Schneider, also unfrozen from time. I am animated too. <laughs> <laughs> and industry legend, Cat Bailey. Perpetually unstuck in time. Help me, I'm in a time warp. <laughs> oh, yeah. A little, uh, little Vonnegut reference there. Uh, I do need to do a little housekeeping. We have a Matrix Resurrection red carpet event happening this Saturday, December 18th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time on all of IGN's channels, including TikTok. I don't know why they put that in parentheses, but this is finger quotes, and this is air parentheses. So, um, all right. We have to start the show off on a little bit of a sad note. Uh, we lost a titan of industry, a legend, the designer of the original NES and the Super NES, Masayuki Uemura, passed away on December 6th. Um, probably one of the unsung heroes of the, uh, of the reason that we're all sitting here in this little grid of, of, of smiling video game faces <laughs> right now. But uh, Pear... Uh, do you think you could uh, sort of regale us with some of your vast knowledge? Yeah, I th look, I think it's important to note how important engineers and, and uh, you know, uh, hardware architects were to, you know, Nintendo's uh, past and, and, and future, right? Nintendo insists on making unique devices that people want to play their games on and and that is uh, that is why we love them so much that they're not always the same as the competition and i think Uemura was really clever at you know seeing trends and realizing what worked even in failed devices and bringing some of the technology over to nintendo so he had come i think from sharp at the time in the early mm -hmm. 70s and with him brought excitement around photocell technology like light guns and said could we turn this into something and you know, uh, Nintendo created the the laser clay shooting system in 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 the early seventies, um, and it would have been a success if the economy had had played nice with them. But like, it was certainly a technical success and a unique device. And he kept going like that, right? He, uh, Pong was huge, and he figured out how to do you know three times two versions of Pong in a standalone system. I got one here, the TV game nice. six, <laughs> um, you know, which which uh, really ha helped Nintendo experiment with these different hardware solutions. He took the concept of, you know, the, the interchangeable cartridges, which uh, Jerry Lawson had introduced with the Fairchild Channel F and the Atari had so successfully done. And instead of saying, we can't do what Atari did because that market failed, he said, no, that's a key to gaming. And, you know, the Famicom and the NES mm -hmm. was born. And so he's been with Nintendo for 33 years, you know, before he retired and, and went to um, Ditsumeikan University and headed up the game studies department there. But like in those 33 years, he's innovated so much. And some of the innovations were really ahead of their time. Like if you think about the Famicom disk system, which we never got in the, in the U.S., right? He created an add-on that was hugely successful. Like he solved the issue of cartridges being so... Uh, so pricey by creating a download system with these floppy disks. And uh, it, it really worked in the Japanese market where you could go to any of the 7-Elevens in, in the big cities and download your games. It's something oh, so you know, cool. might not have worked in the US where we're so spread out. And then uh, in 95, um, he developed the Satella View, which was a way to get games over, you know, over satellite uh, oh, to your homes. That'll never take off. Everyone's going to want them cartridges. And, you know, there, there <laughs> was BS a... Zelda. The BS Zelda. BS Broadcast Satellite, you know, unfortunate uh, acronym in, in the US, obviously. <laughs> uh, those games were not BS, though. What they did was they actually could add voice, like human voice narration to your gameplay. You could play a game while there was basically like a like a DJ narrating a quest. And um, I was talking to a commenter on IGN just last week who said, you know, I hope Nintendo never goes to live service games. I'm like, they already did that. They did that <laughs> way too early. They gave you a Christmas edition of, uh, of a Legend of Zelda game for a limited time that you could play. Um, over this broadcast satellite. And Uemura, you know, as head of uh, R&D2 uh, at Nintendo, was instrumental in really driving software innovation through hardware. And 
you know, he should never be forgotten for that. Um, a lot of the hardware guys are behind the scenes. We we don't hear all their stories and they're not prominently featured in interviews um, throughout the, the time that they work at Nintendo, which I think Nintendo should fix. But I think they're worried that people are going to hire these great people away, right? So That's um, true. Yeah, so if... If you're interested in when would I like, there's lots of research online, obviously. Do some Googling. It's a really fascinating guy and, and seems like a nice person, too. Yeah, I love that picture of him sitting in, in his garden. I, I presume it's his garden playing Famicom and just looking like so joyful. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's a fascinating story. And like, I always love Nintendo says, hey, Donkey Kong is a huge arcade success. Let's figure out how to bring it to a home. And like, we could have just gotten a standalone Donkey Kong device, but he said, how about Donkey Kong is a cartridge instead? And you can expand this. And, you know, it's not just a console, it's a family computer and there'll be add ons. Right. It's like just really awesome visionary designer. Yeah. Well, we thank him for all that he did for us personally and our hobby and most of the stuff that's behind me right now. Also, I believe, I believe we did a let's play of that BS of the game a couple of years ago at IGN. So you can dig that up. Um, oh, no it's, kidding. Yeah. It's very fun because uh, like Paris said that there, there is an announcer who's like 30 minutes left, but <laughs> stuff like that, like, or they will be mm -hmm. like, it's, it's a voice of God that tells you you have X amount of time to get coins and such. And, yeah, it's so it's cool. if you've played the original Zelda game to death, it's it's definitely worth looking at to see the differences. You know what would be hey, you know what Nintendo should do? They have a satellite service now. Bring all those games to a uh, Nintendo Switch Online. Why not? That'd be a really I, neat uh, idea to bring BS yeah. Zelda over like that. Yeah. Yeah, Actually, yeah, I'd be down and, with that. And by the way, the reason why you were able to do a Let's Play is because you know people preserved the code and were able to emulate it. Like Nintendo has not reissued it in any fashion, right? Right. Yeah, We yeah. it was part of um, a, a, a sort of charity live stream for the Video Game History Foundation, who does yep, right. an amazing job in, in, yeah. in, in preservation and stuff like that. So yeah, go dig those up. But yeah, no, I, I mean, to, to what you all said, this, 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 this man was one of the most Im important architects to the foundations of, of this industry. And I don't think it, he was anywhere near being a household name in the same way we have. No. There are like, there have been years of sort of uh, ce celebritizing people within the walls of Nintendo. Mm -hmm. um, and th this, this kind of came as a surprise to me because uh, it was, it, it taught me a lot, you know, and it taught yeah. me how, how little I think so much of us know about this. It's also just awesome to see businessmen in suits with huge smiles on their faces playing video games. Cause that was, <laughs> that was the kind of thing you would see in like nineties or eighties, Nintendo powers and stuff like that in video game magazines. And as a kid, you'd be like, this is possible. <laughs> like every dad I've ever met is the most boring man on earth, but you can be cool and dress up nice and sit yeah. on the floor and play video games. It was very inspiring. Absolutely. It's a bummer to lose these pioneers who helped to find video games back in the seventies and eighties, like slowly, but mm -hmm. surely. Our history is moving on. Rest in peace. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And well, moving on to a lighter note, the Nintendo Switch Indie Direct happened earlier this week, and we're just going to go over a little emphasis uh, on light, right? Because there wasn't emphasis, a lot yeah. in this one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that is true. It was. A, it was. It was a little lighter than I think people were expecting, mm -hmm. but that's all right. There were some sort of uh standouts there was sea of stars which opened the um which opened the presentation which i was instantly i was like well i'm, I'm gonna go i'm gonna go tell <laughs> dan stapleton that i want to review this game because i love it and it's beautiful and i want to live inside of its pixelated world and eventually be buried in its pixelated soil um then there was omori uh another one that wasn't quite as exciting to me as sea of stars but that's okay and then chicory which of course reb who <laughs> often is on this show, will tell you to go play immediately. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I haven't played it yet. No. Yeah. And it's it's Seth okay that... Monster. I know, okay? I have a lot going on. It's, oh, I, it's, love, I love Chicory. It's, it, I, I played it on PC of all places, I think, specifically because it wasn't on Switch yet. Um, mm. But I really, really dig it. It's, uh, you, can, you can make this game as ugly or as pretty as you want it to be, or you can really just not touch a lot of it, a lot of it at all and play it mostly black <laughs> and white. But um, yeah, you, you can make this this game look horrible or beautiful it's up to you it's it's wow. very fun it's very charming it's the yeah. duality of man yeah look <laughs> i I, th I think i think the direct overall was uh it, 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 yeah it, and 
I don't, I don't want to say anything bad about the games being featured because like they're they're wonderful indie games and somebody slaved over them for a long time right like worked really hard on making these very creative games but a lot of them were like yesteryear's hits on steam right like omori yeah. was was really big on steam you know lots of uh, lots of positive feedback on that one like a really kind of clever game you're saying you're not as excited about it it's it's not a game that's about excitement it is about like serious issues and and heavy Sadness. topics very sad game and like but it has a really cool kind of hand drawn color pencil art style um, oh yeah i absolutely love this this style looks really cool yeah and then I, see, sea of stars like the moment you see the footage you're like ooh, it's chrono trigger and then yep. a, a second later it's like oh it's secret of mana right like yep. it is it is from the creators of the messenger the sabotage right and uh they even the the similarities to chrono are not accidental because mitsuda scored uh, or at least was guest composer on the game so mm -hmm. they're really trying to play up that nostalgia for the classic square enix uh, or well square back then squaresoft games um i'm i'm all in on that one so too good. i really oh, want to play yeah. that yeah yep. me too that's one of my most anticipated games of well 2022, but I think a lot of people were hoping to see Silk Song. That is, every time there a new direct happens, people want that Hollow Knight sequel, and mm -hmm. still no sign of it. I'm sure it'll be great when it finally comes out. I th yeah. yeah, I had to hide the hide the chat on YouTube because it was just like Silk Song, Silk Song, Silk Song over yeah. and over again. <laughs> Which I you know I I get, but I think like all in all, I wasn't I wasn't. I wasn't like crazy about this direct, but I wasn't like disappointed with it either. A because no, yeah. we had like 24 hours to even register that it existed. They were just kind of like, oh, by the way, we're doing this like tomorrow. And B, it sort of felt like, um, I don't know, just like a little, like the kind of junk you put in a Christmas stocking at the end of the year, right? Like it wasn't the presents <laughs> under the tree. Oh yeah. The presents under the tree were the game awards and Santa skipped Nintendo's house, I guess, or the other way right. around. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have I would have loved a little more in that department, but this was this was a nice little sort of like bonus thing at the end of the yeah, year. Yeah, this but. was the, the chocolate orange that you mm -hmm. get. I, um, I I went, I was not on last <laughs> week's episode, but I went to the Game Awards and saw them in person and my butt still hurts from sitting there. It was very, very long. And yeah, I, we did the predictions episode. I And, you know, as I was talking about they're not going to be a Breath of the Wild 2 trailer, I thought, oh, maybe maybe there will be one. Uh, obviously, there wasn't anything like that. I did, um, I, I was able to hang out with some some people in the industry afterwards and it does sound like Nintendo is going to have a pretty good year next year. So I would not take the absence of big stuff as like a sign that maybe Breath of the Wild is delayed or that they don't have other stuff because it sounds like people at Nintendo are very excited about 2022. Pair hanging out with, out for drinks with Zelda after the show. <laughs> I, I did go to drinks with Zelda and she said... <laughs> So remember there are all these other cool games that are coming out. No, it, I I got like you know I, I it sounds I'm pretty excited about their their year next year and um you know obviously we'll talk a little bit more about Breath of the Wild too. That that sounds like it it will be a really big one. I've said hmm. this in the past, but we put too much emphasis on big releases on the Nintendo Switch. Yes, say Breath of the Wild two and a Monster Hunter Rise. It's great. It's great to have these big releases, but for me, games like Sea of Stars and Stardew Valley and Hollow Knight have defined the Nintendo Switch's library. I played like 35 games on the Nintendo Switch this year, and I'm willing to bet most of them were indie games. I got Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon on there just waiting for me to play it. So many of these bite-sized experiences are what give the library texture and fill in the gaps between these big uh, releases. So in many ways, in some ways, I look forward more to the indie directs than I do to the bigger Nintendo directs, because even though they're sure they're Steam ports from games that came out a year ago, but guess what? I wasn't really <laughs> playing those games on Steam. I don't play these games on PC. I want to play them on my yeah. Nintendo Switch. Mm -hmm. And Kat, that's that's the that's a level of resilience that many of us learned during the Nintendo <laughs> Wii U era. That was five <laughs> full years of like, well, all right, well, there's some indie games out today. We'll, we'll the try Wii those. Wii U didn't have any. Yeah. It didn't have good indie games. It had a small smattering. The Switch it, gets like everything. <laughs> I know. It, that it is didn't true. have it's... much of anything. You could <laughs> yeah. argue. No, it had obviously had some really big tentpole games on it. But like y y what Brian is describing is like, we're like, ooh, what if there's a really great uh, Animal Crossing coming out? And Nintendo is like, how about a board game with Amiibo instead? Right? Like oh. it was uh, <sighs> it was a tough time. It I'm like, time. look, 
Look, Kat, I love indie games too, and and I did put a, a lot of hours into great indie games on the Switch. But like, I live for Nintendo's tentpole releases. Like, right. yeah. whenever there's a new Zelda or Metroid or a Mario game, that's what makes me get excited and turn off my PlayStation Five or Xbox. Right? Yeah, yeah. I the thing about Nintendo or excuse me, indie games on Switch is every time I see an indie game you know announced that's not on switch i'm like well that should be on switch because that's my preferred way to play and then i tell yeah. myself oh i love playing these indie games handheld oh, oh, you know sitting on the couch and then ultimately i just play them in docked mode as my <laughs> year in review which we're going to get to we'll, we'll attest to later but yeah nothing that was that. the yeah I, hey nothing wrong with that at all but that was the indie direct it was a seven out of ten indie direct i'm just ra rating everything now going into 2022 this is the last show of 2021, by the way. Hey, speaking of uh, handhelds, like my little segue there, two of the four of us have the Analog Pocket. In fact, I reviewed the Analog Pocket for, uh, for IGN.com, and I gave it a nine, uh, which is an amazing because I found it to be quite an amazing device. Normally, this is where I would hold it up, but it's actually uh, upstairs next to my, my dad chair so I can... Just reach over and the play. dad chair. The dad chair. Mm. You keep it next, next to a bottle of whiskey and your your <laughs> vinyl collection. No, I'm cigars. nowhere near that cool. It's next to my fish tank and like a like a bunch of disparate books about like uh, uh <laughs> operating systems and like anime cities. So you're playing it yeah. while watching The Godfather of Goodfellas. <laughs> uh, I mean, those I do watch those quite often. So yeah, that's Seth invites people over to watch Top Gun and check out his sound system all the time. <laughs> That there was a time where that would have been, I'd be like, oh, you can hear the planes coming in, man, from behind you. But, Seth, your uh, review for this, uh, A, was excellent. B, got me you. more hyped than I could have possibly been. It is really hard to uh, explain what a strange road it's been to this, to the to today where I'm actively refreshing everything on FedEx to see if my, my thing's going to show up. Because four <laughs> minutes ago, or four, 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 like three or four minutes, about 400 days ago, there was this weird window where you could pre-order one of these yep and then it was never heard from again until like a couple weeks ago they were like by the way it's shipping in mid-december so you might get mm -hmm. one and then they were like oh we, we might put more pre-orders up um this it was so long ago that it was i believe like one or two apartments ago for me i had to like email customer support and be like i don't live i don't live there anymore i haven't in quite a long time Same for me <laughs> brian yeah yeah yeah, I, I, I got an analog pocket as well. It showed up on Wednesday. I got to try some games. I played Battletoad for the original Game Boy, which whoa. is very underrated in my opinion. It's quite really? beautiful. Yeah, no, really big sprites, very detailed. And it's somewhat unique from the original NES release, which I appreciated. There was also one that, in, that was more of a direct port of the original Battletoads, and I, I think it's a bit worse, but... I also, I, I lost my copies of Metroid 2 and such, <laughs> unfortunately, but I did put in Pokemon Crystal and oh my God, yeah. playing Game Boy games on this thing, it's magnificent. It is clearly yeah. built for Game Boy games, which is kind of brings me to my caveat about the, GB, uh, about the Analog Pocket, which is it can play GBA games and GBA games look very nice, but they're kind of letterboxed. <laughs> and for me... For certain games, like playing Metroid Zero Mission, for example, I found that very distracting. It's not as bad as, say, Pokemon, mm -hmm. but it made me think of, well, they had to make, in trying to make this the all-in-one, all-encompassing system, they had to make some compromises. So, this, However, you can dock the analog pocket and play it on a television screen and that might yes. be the best way to enjoy the GBA games. Yeah, the dock, which I, I think I even mentioned in my review, could probably have its own standalone review because it's it's not just, oh, here's a little way to like, you know, it's not a, it's not like an HDMI pass through or just no, it actually has 2.5 gigahertz radio frequency built in and Bluetooth. So you, I, I paired my Switch Pro controller to the dock like with no problems mm -hmm. whatsoever. And then I was just playing on the big screen and it's just it was so much fun that and wonderful awesome mm -hmm. yeah and then but i was like it's this is this is definitely a luxury item it is it, it oh, is oh yeah it is <laughs> yeah it 
It's I, I, I was going to say borderline. And it's straight up ridiculous just how expensive it is with the dock, with shipping, with the you know the the little bespoke plastic shell that you can buy for it. There's all these you can buy little adapters for Game Gear and Neo yep. Geo and stuff like that. And so you could theoretically be looking at like five six hundred bucks to get everything here because this is a oh, yeah. very and then shipping is like thirty five dollars for it's it's just an, it's it's really really expensive. But I'm so excited for it. And yeah, uh, I got I, I got just the system, and then I read all the reviews, and then luckily Analog the other morning had another window where they were like, "We're doing pre-orders again," and this one was even more stressful because they straight up said like, "We're going to do this in waves," and there's like batch one, two, and three, and three I believe is just straight up 2023. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, oh so, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's a full is... two years from when they first put up pre-orders <laughs> to yeah. begin with, the... and that's when I jumped in and I got I got the dock which i i'm you know if, nice. if yeah, it shows thanks. up it shows up but yeah so I'm, I'm very excited for all this i have a handful of carts and um there's been more and more like kind of cool details coming out about it just the other day i saw uh the it will have game boy camera support and you can save those yep. photos to the sd card internally on the unit like yeah. just fun little things like that that i'm i'm really excited to try they I'm, got a I'm, massive os release coming out that is going to add so many features to the thing. They called it almost the Library of Alexandria for Game Boy games. And it Whoa. can read the cartridge, I believe, and tell you like what kind of information. So you can learn a lot about oh, just the game so based cool. on the database. Yeah, it's really mm -hmm. neat. So oh, wow. Yeah. And then on top of all of the other little features like being able to quick save games and things like that. So it's so flexible. And of course the hardware itself is absolutely beautiful it's yeah. great release yeah it's uh part of the problem that the, you know the reason that this is now in these weird waves where the ones are, are out is the uh, the chip shortage obviously but for things like field programmable gate arrays which is what allows this uh device to not it's not emulating anything as far as the electronics are concerned, there is a Game Boy inside. There is a Game Boy Advance inside. There is a Neo Geo Pocket inside because of these, you know, it's like really complicated and I'm not an engineer by any means. But basically all of the transistors that were inside your Game Boy have been shrunk to a tiny little you know, easy to swallow pill. Please don't swallow it. It's probably bad for you. <laughs> and for whatever reason, that sort of hardware has become even like more difficult to to produce than you know even like a playstation 5 mm -hmm. at this point so that's that's a huge bummer the other bummer i will say about it is as cool as the firmware update sounds like it's going to be updating the firmware kind of a pain i, yeah. I don't like having to format of course I, my micro sd card i put it in and i went to format it on windows and it didn't have fat 32 which it has to be a formatted in FAT32. So I had to get my Linux machine, which makes me feel even like more of a dork than I already am. Um, but then I, you know, I used Gparted and I did a whatever. Nobody wants to hear about it. We, we don't know what you just said, but um, I'm well, looking, I mean, I, look, I, I don't have this problem because I'm still waiting on my order. Oh, no. Well, but, um, no, it says yeah. between, between December 14th and December 30th was the window. It's heartbreaking. So, oh my God. Yeah. So it might be might be a Christmas miracle, might be oh. a, might be a New Year's toast. We'll see. Well, I hope. I just got an update from FedEx, but it is a JPEG of a middle finger. So I'm gonna have to... <laughs> okay. <laughs> this just in. <laughs> Anything goes with them, but no. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm incredibly sympathetic to all the all the the chip shortages and and shipping issues and stuff like that. This one was strange because I think it's coming. It's coming from like Chino, California, or something. And so I thought this was like this whole thing where this this was you know designed by like brilliant Swedish people in in a in a mountain <laughs> laboratory or something. But no, it's, it's just, all clockwork. It's, it's coming from a couple hours ago. Oh wait, but yeah, yeah, I'm really excited for this. There's there's obviously there's a, no shortage of ways you can play your old games. Um, there are people on eBay uh, and all over the place really that sell modded Game Boys and GBAs that have you know front lit screens and stuff like that. Um, there are all of these. Um, sort of third party devices that that mimic exactly what a Game Boy can do, but with better image quality and stuff. But this is this is from what I've I've picked up the the best way to ever to, to yeah. play them in handheld mode, period. Because yeah. it, it just takes into into account uh so many different factors and I'm I'm very, very excited for it. Yeah, to, to give you an idea, the original Game Boy's resolution is 160 by 144 pixels. And 
the uh, analog pockets resolution is 1600 by 1440 pixels. So uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there, but man, oh, that display is just so good looking. There's no bad way to look at it. I, I'm, I'm a big, big this fan. This is what I want to do. I want to awesome. get the TurboGrafx-16 adapter. Yes. And I want to get Bomberman on it Ooh. if I can. And then I want to connect four controllers and play some Bomberman. That would be killer. Right? Yeah. I, just the that, fact that I, I love all the adapters. I can't wait for the TurboGrafx yeah, one. Yeah, it's got all these adapters, and it uh, supports, like, the link cable. Um, the uh, the Game Boy, uh, the e-reader, you have to get a cable for that, but it supports it. It, uh, it doesn't fit in there. But in the review, I, I thank Kat and Reb for sending me, like, the craziest selection of <laughs> Game Boy and GBA games because it was so fun to just go through. Like, I, I played Chess Master for five seconds but then i played you know tony hawk 3 on game boy advance which is actually i never played before it's actually not bad it's the same with the doom uh version on game boy advance which right. i was like well this will be funny because doom runs on everything and then i started playing it and i was like actually this is this is a pretty competent uh, G uh the, port of doom the gba was surprisingly good at um first person shooters from the sort of you know early pc yeah. days um yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I really dig that. Like that's uh, that also like I know specifically um, the the from the sack of games uh, of which they sent to you. Like because that was a that was this big box kicking around IGN for years, and we would just periodically like flip through it and just start cackling because there's just so <laughs> just there's so weird many strange stuff. yeah just so much oh. weird stuff in there. You want to play Perfect Dark on the Game Boy? Because you can. I did. You can. <laughs> It's and got a built-in rumble pack. It's got a built-in rumble pack <laughs> with a AAA battery, and you can actually feel the rumble, which is kind of weird. Uh, I am i didn't get the chance to play David Beckham soccer, though, but that uh -huh. that's on the docket. We'll, we'll put that one in the, in, the, in the maybe pile. I saw this uh, amazing video kicking around YouTube, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I forget who made it, but uh, you can look it up. But it was like the one big problem with the analog pocket, and it was like a 60-second video that showed that it does. it's not compatible with the DDR uh game boy advanced <laughs> dance pad which which was i believe a, a clip-on thing that only worked on the sp models um because the, oh, the regular know. the launch gba was too wide but the sp models are are slim and it's this clip-on thing that like hugs around and, and has the dance pad buttons on it so unfortunately that will not work on your pocket so just damn you know, oh. buyer beware I know man, dozens of you were worried about that. <laughs> it's so cool that you can use the link cables, and I think you can connect the analog pocket to an actual classic Game Boy, and it'll work. That's uh man. Yeah, there's no reason why it wouldn't work, because as far I mean, it is it is the actual original hardware. That's like when the, when the Flintstones met the Jets, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably a GBA game. It, it is probably like $800. <laughs> Well, I'll stop uh, bumming Brian and Pear out as they re refresh their their tracking information about the analog pocket. But if you want to read the review, I did. It. I loved it. I gave it a nine out of ten. Red did some amazing um, video uh, and some amazing photography of it. You just now the fun game is is that Red's hand are those Red's hands or my hands in the video? Uh, <laughs> shout, shout it out in the comments. This is our last show of twenty twenty one which is, you know, sad, but I'm looking forward to 2022 because it's, it repeats and I like that. It feels good inside my brain. But we all had a chance to do our Nintendo Switch year in review. If you are a Nintendo player, you probably got, or if, excuse me, if you have an account, you get an email that said, hey, when you're done looking at your, you know, Spotify year in review, come over to Nintendo and look at, uh, look at your year in review. And uh, I think it would be kind of cool if we compared and contrasted our stats. Uh, let me see. Let me pull mine up here. Uh, if anyone would like to go first, because I am not very professional and I forgot to do this beforehand, so now I have to dig it up. My most played game of 2021 on the Nintendo Switch was Monster Hunter Rise, which I spent 108 hours playing, Woo! which was mostly wow. going through all the content with my friends and grinding and everything. It pretty much dominated my first half of the year. Other mainstays included Bravely Default 2 and, of course, Metroid Dread. Both of those games were excellent this year. I played 35 games in total, and I spent uh, about 450 hours, <laughs> which was down, actually, from last year when I played, like, 600 hours. 500 of those, which went to Animal Crossing New Horizons. And by Damn. the way, I put, 
I put another 80 hours into Animal Crossing when that new expansion came out. So <laughs> I've been wow. keeping busy, but I I don't know. Like, I don't know how this compares with other people. I'm sure there are people who put a lot more hours into Switch because you kind of have to play everything. But mm-hmm. uh, the Switch is definitely my most played console. It's the thing that just kind of comes with me everywhere. It's a lovely little machine, and there were some nice games that I really enjoyed this year. I've, yeah, me too. I, I was the, the seeing the last year's stats was incredibly sobering, Cat. Like the mm-hmm. the especially the Animal Crossing. I was I think it's four hundred hours for me for Animal Crossing last year. Mm. Um, I I definitely had a lighter year on Switch this year because um, I played a lot more stuff pretty much everywhere. Um, but weirdly enough, m- some of my most played games this year were uh, Metroid. No More Heroes 3, which I played a ton of and really oh, loved. Wow. But you my really number liked it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And my number one was Pikmin 3 because my kid is obsessed with it and is con- we we've, I've, we've, we've finished that game like start to finish so many times. I'm sick of it, but <laughs> it brings her <laughs> joy, so that's that's parenting. Yeah, that's interesting. I my my most played game on Switch, I didn't actually expect that was Skyward Sword HD with 44 hours. Oh, so that is that is way less uh than, you know, Animal Crossing and I actually I played Monster Hunter Rise on another account, so I have to look that one up. But like uh Grindstone 32 hours, Metroid Dread 27 hours cuz I went back and and got everything there was to get in that game. But like last year, um Already travel was dead last year. I do a lot of switch playing on airplanes because I right. travel to New York and you know to to Japan and stuff. And obviously there wasn't much of that last year and this year, but still last year I had 113 hours of Picross S4, and that was just from wow. travel. Whenever I, I'm on an airplane, I'm like, I, I always go, ah, I don't want to put on headphones. So I pr- play Picross and I just play it silently because there's only three pieces of music and we'll drive you nuts. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I did, um, I, I played way less Switch this year and fewer games as well. Um, you know, I think it was something like 65 games uh, uh, this year versus like over 100 the, the year before. And that's because the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox came out. And so I, you know, I played a lot of the biggest games that those consoles had to offer, obviously, you know, uh, I I'm still playing Forza and Halo uh, mostly right now. Um so the 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 Switch did take a hit for me especially um I didn't play as many indies as I tried out in the year before. Mm. Well, I, I figured out what kind of like um made my Switch get sidelined a lot this year and it it was this thing is the Backbone controller. Oh, um, oh yeah, which I, I got used, one of those that's so good. Yeah, I, I I've been using it to use cloud gaming and remote play for my other consoles and stuff like that. Um and so, like, I'm still playing a ton of handheld, but I'm mm-hmm. just not connecting with my Switch as much. But, and mm-hmm. it was also like there was stuff like Metroid, which I adored, but it it wasn't a time sink like Animal Crossing was, right? I didn't yeah. put 540 hours into it or whatever. No, yeah. they, they did they... not find the input delay of cloud gaming kind of obnoxious. It's like it doesn't bother you. Not really. I think if I'm like if if I'm playing like uh. Like I, I wouldn't do it for like a Halo Infinite multiplayer match or something like that. But right. when I'm just messing around playing Far Cry or something, it's it's kind of not a non-issue for me. Yeah, nice. and I, I, one thing about you know the time spent on Switch, um, there weren't any major open world games. Like the, what was mm. there, I loved. Mm. Right, like Skyward Sword uh, and Metroid are Metroid slash Zelda likes, right? Uh, Metroidvania slash Zelda likes, and like you explore a lot. But they're very compact. Like you can beat Metroid Dread way faster than my 27 hours that I spent total in it. Bowser's 3D world was open world, but it was a small playground. And so when I compare, like three of these games will fit into one Ubisoft game that I may have played on the other consoles like uh, Valhalla or Far Cry, right? And so um, I think that will probably change next November when we're playing Breath of the Wild 2. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And we'll get all the Fingers playground across. games next year with Legends mm-hmm. Arceus as well. Oh yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. Uh the Xbox and PlayStation 5 actually pushed me toward playing the Switch more this year because okay. uh my youngest son has basically he just takes over the, <laughs> the Xbox and the PlayStation 5. Like I tried to play Halo Infinite multiplayer and he's been doing all his progress on my account. And I felt bad because he's got some hard-earned armor and stuff. So I'm just like, you know what? You're 13. You're, you're a little fella. Just do what you like. But yeah, I put in 312 hours on my Switch this year, which was up 
from 182 the year before. And my most played game was 84 Hours of Bravely Default 2. Oh, of yeah. course. There, I reviewed Bravely Default 2, but I think it only took me about 65 hours to beat Bravely Default 2. Um, in fact, uh, I was feeling pretty, pretty good about myself and my nerd cred because I was like, ha ha, the most I played of any game was nine hours of Bravely Default 2 on a Saturday. And then I was uh, looking through the Twitter timeline and I see industry legend Cat Bailey with 11 hours in one day. And I was like, ah, damn it. <laughs> that was the day that I was trying to roll credits on Bravely Default 2. And there were like three credits. Like you yeah. hit the credits like three <laughs> yeah. times in that game. Yep. So I was just like, I'm going to beat this game. I'm finishing this game this weekend. And finally I got to it. But seriously, it did take like 11 hours to get to that point. A lot of yeah, grinding. I, that might've been why I was, I did the same thing, I, but I don't remember for sure. It was like, I think January 31st. So it was during my review period, but um, yeah, I gave that one an eight because it's great. I also reviewed Pac-Man 99, which was my second most played game which i was oh, very wow. surprised i played 25 hours of pac-man 99 dang wow. yeah that that was a lot of pac-man especially because the it's like a two second game <laughs> to play so i played a lot of matches of that and then uh i also played oh i played 25 hours of animal crossing which is really not very much but that was all in like october whenever the the um the mm -hmm. latest update the came out. yeah came the expansion out. Yeah. came out because i hadn't I fallen off Animal Crossing completely, and then that came out, and I put in you know basically an hour a day for almost the entire month. So I did I did a system transfer to the OLED uh, around the time when, when it first came out, and I believe that was that was roughly around when the expansion came out, and my uh, island didn't make the transfer, and so I was <gasps> oh, just no. like I was really bummed out about it, and then I was like you know what I'm not going to give up, and I. I dug through a bunch of settings and pulled out the old system and and resurrected it. So everyone lives, all the animals are okay. Nice. It probably probably still looks terrible there cuz I haven't visited in a while, so there's cobwebs and skeletons and whatever else happens when you don't go to go to your town for a while, <laughs> but I'm definitely excited to go back to it and see how everyone's doing. If, as soon as I get past that conversation where they're like Things have been horrible. <laughs> Please save us or whatever mm -hmm. they do. But it, it's not as cruel, and it does, they don't make you feel as bad. In fact, they're they're kind of uh, when I went back to it, everyone's really excited to see you. They don't make you feel bad. They're not like, "Wow, this place is a dump. You abandoned us. How could they're you?" They're like, "Hey, it's you. They're like, oh wow, wow. you're in your house yeah. for like eleven months. Yeah, okay? that's exactly. <laughs> and they get all excited to see you, and then you know sometimes they'll give you a present. Like, here's a blanket." Mm. Like, oh, hell yeah, thanks for the for the blanket. That's that's great. And it's fun to stomp on roaches. It is fun to stomp. It is, it. yes. That, has, that has been a joy of mine since the GameCube era. Yeah. Always fun in that game. Since since I was a child, I love to stomp on roaches in video games and in real life. That is not true. <laughs> Stomping so on gross. bugs is disgusting. But hey, I played 267 hours in docked mode and 45 hours in handheld, which is pretty surprising oh. to me that I played that much handheld given the fact like pair there was no travel and then the one time i did travel was when i hadn't set my switch to be the primary and i couldn't play any of my games because they were all digital so yeah it's one reason that i'm on switch so much is that we'll be watching tv or something like an episode of bob's burgers and that's just when i'll break out my switch and be playing it silently in handheld mode it's great when i'm just watching tv or something mm. however i did hook up the oled dock to one of my computer monitors and that got me to play it more in docks especially when i was playing metroid dread yeah yeah i i, I have two-thirds of my time was uh playing docked and that's because games like metroid i want it on the big screen even though on the oled it looks fantastic yeah um and then I think most of the undocked, most of the handheld time wasn't in, in my few flights that I took to LA. It was uh, exactly what you described, watching TV shows that maybe my wife is more into than I am and like doing menial tasks in Animal Crossing. Um, and there were a couple of Shine Spark puzzles that I did in handheld too, because I had to try them over 900,000 <laughs> times um, that I did in handheld mode as well on the couch. One of the, the greatest features of the Nintendo Switch for playing in docked is, well, for me at least, is how you can be the absolute laziest piece of crap in the world and just take the Joy-Con out and just like throw your arms down to the side and, and lean back mm -hmm. and in any position you want or like put one behind your head and lean back like that. You're <laughs> playing like a complete weirdo. 
I can't I, I can't get over how much I love just being as lazy as possible playing just with the a sloth guns. person. Just, oh just, yeah, just yeah, it's just great coming down from a tree all day holding my Joy-Con and then climbing back up before the the alligators get to me. Yep. Mm-hmm. I take it very literally as moss grows on my back. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was our Nintendo Switch year or our Nintendo Switch years in review. 2021. What a great year. 2022. I'm going to beat all my records, especially if Breath of the Wild 2 does, in fact, come out in 2022. Excuse me, 2022. I'll probably have 267 hours docked on just like Breath of the Wild 2 alone. But, uh, you know, speaking of Breath of the Wild 2, some patents came out. It'd be perfect for us to talk about in our news rundown. Uh, They patented all kinds of crazy stuff for uh, Breath of the Wild 2, like phasing through objects and (laughs) shooting your bow and arrow as you fly backwards through time in space. It's kind of not something that I thought needed to be patented i thought that it was oh. just like a game feature but oh but pair you 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 say you say oh with a with sort of a, a knowing nod well you know the game designers get really annoyed if the kind of gameplay concepts that they work on and tweak and make feel just right get replicated right mm-hmm. like look look at how smash brothers looks and plays and then look at the other games that look and play just like smash brothers right and it's the same i don't know if i'd say just like but sure Mm, well not as good or kart racers or the way combat feels in a zelda game there's something very unique to when you hit something with a sword in zelda in the first 3d zelda games that felt very different from every other game on the market now they all feel it feel like that right and so Game designers get annoyed and more and more patent gameplay elements. Sometimes it's silly. Like I remember Sega patenting uh, hitting a switch to change the perspective from inside your car to behind the car. And like in the end, you can't enforce those patents. Like it's very difficult to figure out who actually invented it and nobody enforces it. But like in in this case, Nintendo felt strongly enough to patent some of these uh, concepts. Now, the phasing thing is so weird and obscure. Like I can't, I can't even imagine. Yeah, there's like some ever... geometry going on there. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I can't imagine that they'd ever go after a company for having something similar to it. And then the the object one you describe, it's kind of cool because it offers a hint at time playing a factor in the next Zelda game much more. That you can, in addition to you know, it's it's similar to the magnetism and like you know hitting things and. Mm. Uh, arresting things in space like this has like a time and a rewind right rewind function baked into that sort of interaction yeah i mean more than anything it's a cool thing for us to see get a glimpse at like how hard they work on coming up with original kind of physics based uh, uh play things and things to do in that game yeah it, it made the first thing that came to mind is it made me wonder like did they watch all those crazy videos of people just breaking breath of the wild you know like <laughs> absolutely and just and like, let's make that into a feature or something that's even more breakable for this and then they came out with this you know all these crazy things that don't make any sense you know you know what it kind of makes me wonder is so when we saw the e3 trailer it looked a little bit like skyward sword yeah and maybe some of that was intentional like they were going oh, let's connect it to skyward sword just a bit more so people will actually mm-hmm. buy this thing but it makes me wonder if they're going to be doing kind of a greatest hits approach to this where they have elements from a lot of the different 3D Ooh. Zeldas put into Breath of the Wild 2. So, because when you say time travel, the first thing I think is Ocarina of Time. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So, we have like some Skyward Sword stuff, some Ocarina of Time stuff, and Wind Waker stuff get in there. Could there be like <gasps> ocean and sailing? It's still like, my heart. I, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Yeah, the 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 forwarding, the rewinding time and manipulating time around object interactions sounds really interesting to me. Like it sounds like more of a puzzle element, right? Like Link to the mm-hmm. Past had the thing where you you travel between two worlds and there are certain things differently. Like this is different. This is a mechanic where they manipulate objects through through that sort of feature. Um it's uh, like it's really exciting to me because what they're doing, these are things that are really complicated to get right without completely breaking your game world, right? Like the the slowing down of time and being able to execute all these different moves in the air, 
um, is something that we saw in the last game and they're expanding on it in this one. And what gets yeah. me excited is like, there will be people so good at this that it's going to oh, yeah. just be a joy to watch what they do with this, these features and how they interact in this kind of sandbox. Um, it's, I'm, I'm super excited for this game. I, oh. can't, I can't wait. I think that's yeah. exactly why this is taking so long too. There's just a million different moving parts that need yeah. to be put together properly, specifically because people are going to do videos where you're like, I have no idea how you did that. You know, <laughs> there were, yeah. the, half of the fun of Breath of the Wild wasn't just playing it, which was amazing and one of my favorite video game experiences ever. But it was it was going on social media or YouTube every single day and being like. Oh, you can you can freeze a boat and then beat the hell out of it so hard that you can use it to fly to <laughs> Ganon's house. And and, like, and they and it's right. not an act it's not an accident, right? Like people discovered certain things afterwards that probably Nintendo didn't think about it, but they created the world to let you do it. Yeah. But like the fire thing, right? Four Swords Adventures um, Z multiplayer Zelda game introduced the concept of setting setting a, something in, on fire in Zelda and the fire spreads, right? Before it was always like you could set something on fire, but it was confined. Now a lot of open world games have you burning grass, but this game created the updraft, right? Yeah. Like something burns and now it becomes a physic, physics element that lets you fly into the air and suddenly completely different strategies were born to attack you know, your enemies. Like you set fire deliberately so you can get airborne and take them all out from the air. And it's, man, like if these patents are any indication, like that phasing thing is going to be a really, um, really crazy big element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited. I mean, I just remember with the original one when we, we found out you could just climb anything. And that yeah. seemed impossible. Like, how could you do that? There's no way to implement it. It'll break the game if you could just climb right. everything. And now it's so simple. Like, obviously, you can climb everything. And then we also thought that every game ever going forward was going to just let you climb every. Nope. Wrong. <laughs> Nobody yeah. has done it yet. But it's, it's wild all... how influential Breath of the Wild has still managed to be. Yeah. During uh, the TGAs, I think we saw Sonic, what was it, Frontiers? Which oh, is yes. Breath of Sonic. So yeah, I mean, yep. everybody wants their own Breath of the Wild now. Well, there yeah. was even the, there was the interview with the developers of Halo Infinite uh, talking about how they yeah. wanted that game to be more like Breath of the Wild, and and I, I think there, there's obviously a lot of these people or a lot of these devs wear the influence on their sleeves, and others sort of hide it, and others it's just sort of a coincidence. But with Halo Infinite specifically, I think that like it was you you get a, a grappling hook in that game and it half the time you're using it to climb really tall structures it doesn't feel like you're supposed to be up there it's kind of like yeah. when like skyrimming up a mountain you know where you're like i'm not <laughs> supposed to be doing this and horizon had a lot of that Sideways too job. yeah where you're just kind of just like nah, I'm, should, should i be here but breath of the wild always sort of felt like yeah you should be there and you can yeah. be there um and and it, we're encouraging you to be there because there might be something at the top and if you brought enough you know, garbage to eat on this mountain. Maybe you can get up to the top of it, you know, stop that, and have a snack. That, that's, um, a, that's a Nintendo design genius, right? When yeah. you go like, you're like, oh, I'm going to look behind the waterfall. I bet nobody's ever gone there. And it's like, mm, they put a treasure chest there. So right. they wanted you to go there. Like Nintendo does that a lot. And I think, I think the phasing element is probably an evolution of Rivali's Gale from the last game, right? Where once you have this power, now you're unleashed and you can fly up to higher places without the slow climb. And I, and I think it points towards this game being much more about verticality. We saw, oh, we so saw excited. Link, we saw Link like air dropping in, right? Yeah. Like doing his, uh, doing his base jumping there. I think the phasing is the way you traverse vertically between these different floating islands in a really fast fashion. Um, to, and, to add to that, I yeah. actually think that that um, that you'll also be able to go vertically downwards because this, this like this 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 one diagram we saw of you know people this man this stick figure man sort of uh, phasing through the the earth. Um, some of the earliest footage we saw for this game was underground, not necessarily like a dungeon. But what if yeah. this is a game where you have your sort of base high rule? You can also go up into the sky, but then there's sort of like a kind of Looney Tunes portable hole aspect of it where you can drop <laughs> an, a thing down and then fall through to the subterranean sections of the map. And it doesn't oh, mean that, cool. yeah, I, and I don't think they'll, you know, there will be that across the entire map, but because um, that just feels like a lot, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there will be. And I, I think that that could be a really interesting aspect of sort of, okay, how do I get over this mountain? Maybe I don't, maybe I go under this mountain and then pop up in the middle of it. Maybe there's yeah. a cave or something like, oh, I'm, I'm just really, really excited to see where they go with this. I think the foundation they built for this 
franchise moving forward is brilliant. And there's obviously a couple of things I wanted to see them add, like dungeons and stuff like that. But if if they're building a multi-tiered sandbox here, like that is incredibly exciting. Like, yeah. man, that, that gives explains me explains why it's taken so long. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hey, oh God. Take your time, Nintendo. It's yeah, okay. please. But 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 also give it to me now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so excited. I, I want to go. I'm gonna probably like restart Breath of the Wild again. I haven't played it since uh, it came you out. You know, I kind of want to like watching all that B-roll, maybe go, yeah, kind of yeah. play Breath of the Wild again. My mm -hmm. oldest son has played through Breath of the Wild three times. And wow. when he gets onto it and he starts and I I hear the sound effects or like the certain musical notes or just like a voice and it just brings me back like to all the magic. I'm like, oh man, if he weren't playing it right now, I would be. But mm -hmm. we'll see. So yeah, those are some extremely cool patents. I'm so excited for 2022, knock on wood, that we get the Breath of the Wild sequel. And then we'll find out the name and the name will be The Legend of Zelda Phasing Through Stuff. And that's why they didn't want to tell us because it gives everything away right there. Yeah. A couple other that's news blasts before we uh, before we move on. Uh, Switch was again the best selling console. No surprise there. So it's like thirty five out of the last thirty six months. The Nintendo Switch was the best selling console. Uh, there's a new Arceus trailer that introduces Hisu. I uh, I don't know how to say Hisui's his Hisui's Clans yeah. Merchants uh, and Mario Kart sixty four is celebrating its twenty fifth anniversary. So if you want to feel <clears throat> old there are people on my team who are younger than mario kart 64 look oh the, man look at the japan yeah. stats for nintendo it's wild oh it's between bananas. the switch and the ps5 yeah the ps5 sold like a thousand units and the switch yeah. sold like 192 000. like I, yeah. I i was looking at those numbers this morning i'm just absolutely floored by them uh the friend of the show uh oj player essence tweeted them out too and it, it was he was just talking about how bizarre it is to sort of see PlayStation, not necessarily like give up in Japan, but it, it just doesn't feel like they're fighting the same fight there. And Nintendo is just is just crushing it globally. It's it's yeah. kind of amazing to see. And it it is a it is a bummer, you know, like it's it's I like to see more competition everywhere. I, I like, you know, we all grew up reading Japanese <clears throat> video game magazines and reading like the, the Famitsu uh, like and you know their version of MPD and stuff like that. Um, it is it is odd to see, but um, I'm yeah. happy for Nintendo because it's it's well earned. Yeah, look, I th I think we just had the Battle of Helm's Deep, and the war is not over yet. The war, the the War of the Ring is about to start once Sony actually has inventory, and I think that is the that that's the big issue for you know like PlayStation. There are just not enough PlayStation fives out there. It's frustrating for everybody, and I sure. think I think Sony focused on the Japanese market. Yes, uh, on the, sorry, on the US the market. PS4. The PS5 is outpacing the PS4 globally. Yeah. I don't think the PS5 will ever get a foothold in Japan because the market is just fundamentally different than it used to be. Uh, yeah, right. Not since the PS2 era has a Sony platform been truly, truly a breakout success. Even the PS4, which was better than the PS3, like it wasn't that successful ultimately. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's because the Japanese market is so handheld focused, it's so mobile focused. Right. And that's why. The Switch yeah. has been able to been able to get a foothold there. All the Japanese developers are working on there. Japanese developers who work on big time consoles, they're globally focused now. They're making games for global audiences, not Japanese audiences necessarily. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's just a reflection of the times, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I'm, I, I think that the PlayStation would have outsold the Switch this month if there was enough on store shelves. But uh, I said Japan. I meant uh, Sony is focused on the U.S. Sony, yeah. you know, yeah. the the software is very West focused, and I, I think they're not. I, you know, my my daughter lives in Japan and has never seen a PlayStation Five in the wild in any store, and maybe that's to be fair, the US as well. we we haven't, yeah, yeah we haven't seen yeah. them yeah. here. Yeah. Exactly. The thing is, I, I, I have a two. Star. Try uh -huh. imagine putting that in a Japanese entertainment center. I'm sorry. I was just going to make the joke that the uh, the apartments are famously very small in Japan. And then you have, you know, it's either, do I get a, a PlayStation 5 or an air conditioning unit? Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's, either it's, or. You, I mean, we, we've all been, you know, working in and around this industry long enough, like to, uh, especially long enough to remember, like the laughing stock that was the Xbox sales in Japan in general, Xbox launches in Japan at the the you know the, the the big camera store where they sell electronics and stuff like that and it was it was just like one guy with a green hat and he's like yeah xbox like <laughs> it's just bizarre to see playstation get to almost get to that status in yeah. in in japan where it is really they, weird they still are headquartered in many ways you know like 
It's surprising, yeah. but good for Nintendo. I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I think we're still very, very early, and like you know, let let Sony make some PlayStation fives first. Well, yeah, that is true, and I do know that they have shifted most of them. their inventory and shrink them. Yeah, but they've shifted most of their inventory to the U.S. because they know that instantly they will just be snatched up by humans or robots. And so. to to sort of like recalibrate how impressive the Switch sales are in general, and everyone knows this, it is yet to receive an actual official price drop. You know, there's oh, yeah. there's that well, there's that, it received that, a price drop overseas. It has not in the United States. Oh, that's right, that's right. So, in, but in the U.S., they've they've trotted out that annual Mario Kart bundle for every the year, fifth fifth year, fourth fifth year in a row, or whatever. Yep. Um, and I get it. I'm part of the problem. I I I gifted my uh my old old older Switch uh to my nephew because uh my my brother said that he you know you want to start playing old Nintendo games with this kid. And I was like, well, they stopped selling the NES Classic for some reason I'll never understand. So the best way to do it now is either to pirate everything, which I don't, you know, go have fun if that's what you want to do, but it's a weird thing to do with like a four-year-old that's like <laughs> get, a, get a gaming PC and, uh, you know, pirate a bunch of stuff. Or get in it, get a Switch and get a bunch of, uh, you know, a couple of years of NES or Nintendo Online or whatever it is, yep. and then play the games through there. And I was like, you know what? I should get him Mario Kart to go with it and i was like i'll get it for him digitally so he doesn't lose the thing so i i put my credit card into his new switch and i bought mario kart 8 for 59.99 digitally yep. in 2021 like a huge schmuck and <laughs> i just want to apologize i'm part of the problem i'm part of the reason why we don't have a sequel to that game yet because dumb people like me keep doing dumb things like that and so i take full responsibility but there you um, have it. It's all Brian's fault. It's Stop all Brian. It. Brian? Stop mm -hmm. it. Thank you for thank you for sharing that with us and, and coming clean that it's all your fault. <laughs> There's gonna be so many people in the chat being like, you can get it, uh, you can get it this is cheaper here. And I know, I know. I screwed up. I screwed up. I, I you know I took the L. All right. Took, Keep it locked to the IGN deals on Twitter. It's about so. family. It's about family. <laughs> all right. Speaking of family, I don't have a segue here. But we do have <laughs> The most important part of every episode, and that is the cat take. Cat, take it away. Oh, oh man, pretty proud of that one. 2021 encapsulated everything that we love and find very annoying about Nintendo. Ooh. On the Love Ledger, some amazing games from Nintendo this year. We got Metroid Dread, which, no, it wasn't yet another open world game. And you know what? Good. Good, I'm glad it's not just another open world game. It was an action game that was made to perfection. Well done right there. And we got actually quite a few really good games on the Nintendo Switch this year. Be Monster Hunter Rise and Bravely Default 2 and Shin Megami Tensei 5. Okay, these are all games that I would like <laughs> generally, but whatever. Plus uh, the usual smattering of indie games from Death Door and Chikri and all of that. But of course, on the flip side, while the Switch OLED was... It, okay, I like my Switch OLED quite a bit, but let's be honest, it is not what we were necessarily hoping for from a Switch Pro. And of course, I I think that the Nintendo Switch Online is just not great. Just not great. And the expansion pass, like, they kind of got a pass because a lot of different other places kind of screwed up a lot worse. <laughs> but if you compare it, especially with Nint uh, Sony getting ready to... Uh, upgrade PlayStation Plus, the expand the Nintendo Switch Ooh. Online is just kind of been finding found wanting, right? So and Nintendo, I don't necessarily know what they're doing, trying to do some in some ways. It feels like they're trying to evolve themselves into a transmedia company where they have amusement parks and they have Chris Pratt <laughs> doing oh, a Mario so cool. movie. Yeah. And they want to move forward a bit into the future with you know, Nintendo Switch Online, but haven't always been entirely successful. So they've been able to ride some decent momentum, but they've also fallen flat in some ways. So yeah, interesting, interesting year for Nintendo, all told. I played a lot of Nintendo Switch, still love you, Nintendo, but yeah, I think you got some New Year's resolutions that you want to take care of in 2022, starting with figuring out what the heck you want to do with that expansion. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I think you completely nailed it. If if you were to rank the years of the Nintendo Switch's life, which I'm sure someone at IGN will do because 
we legally have to rank everything for some reason. <laughs> we just love ranking stuff. Um, I I don't think this would be the best one. I might actually be the worst. Um, but still, did you just still, say this was the worst year for Switch? I think it was. I think it's better than last year. Like just mm. no. There's nothing on an Animal Crossing level, but after Animal Crossing, boy, did Nintendo Switch drop off hard last year. So I, right. I think this year is certainly better than last year, unless you know you count Hades, but that came out on. on I, I I think that's totally fair. I think I think for me specifically this year, like Metroid was absolutely amazing. It's an incredible surprise. It was also, uh, I believe, it was it was announced. What at E three? At E three, yeah. And then we were we were playing it a few months later, which is mm -hmm. uh, unheard of. I mean, we spent fifteen minutes talking about Breath of the Wild, which is uh, doesn't have a title or a, re a release date yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so but, waiting on Prime Four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that too. Um, but the, and and there are some there are some other like really great games this year, and, and lots of awesome indie stuff too. But I think the like the OLED was was not was not the leap I wanted it to be. And it's mm -hmm. definitely cool. Yeah. And I think if you've if you've haven't never owned a Switch or you only had one since uh, the launch one, it's it's on its deathbed, then it's it's a great way to go. But I had I had the the red box switch that had, you know, the nine hours of battery life or whatever. Oh nice. And it's you know, that was a weird it was a weird upgrade. Like it's it didn't really feel like a big leap, but yeah, I don't know. It was not not my favorite of their years. You know, it I, wasn't I like one that there was I think there was a nice mm -hmm. cadence to this year, especially compared to previous years. There was a pretty big game coming out almost every quarter, right? Because at the beginning of the year, we got Rise. During the summer, we got the Skyward Sword HD. And then in the fall, we got SMT5 and uh, Metroid Dread. So it felt like, even though they weren't like on a Breath of the Wild 2 level, there were like a decent number of kind of temple exclusives being released pretty regularly for the Switch this year. And mm -hmm. a lot of them were very good. Yeah, Bowser's, Bowser's Fury was this year too. Mm. It was really good. It was just, right. I think, I think what, what Brian is reacting to is that, you know, there are sometimes years where Nintendo like taps exactly to the zeitgeist and you get something like a Wii Fit moment, a Smash moment, a Breath of the Wild moment, a Pokemon Go moment, or last year, Animal Crossing, right? If last year's game was Animal Crossing and it wasn't just us putting hundreds of hours into it. It was, there were talk shows hosted in Animal Crossing. Celebrities were talking about Animal Crossing and sharing their towns with everybody. And so I think last year felt more like a, like there was a story to switch. Whereas mm. like I, and, and it had some other good games that people didn't talk more, much about. Like Origami King is actually really, really good. I love that game. Oh yeah. But it was, but it was under the radar. Whereas like this year, yeah, there were more releases. They were all more kind of like smaller pocket releases, and so um, it wasn't a it wasn't a bad year. I didn't hate this year, but like it didn't Switch didn't define this year for me as it did last year as much. Like for me, what this did define this year. Like what was the thing well, that defined twenty twenty one? I would. I, I think Q4 is, is owned by Xbox. Yeah, I, think I think Xbox, it's yeah. not selling as well as the other two machines, but Xbox with Game Pass has created something really unique where it made me try out games that I probably wouldn't have played. And then Forza is Forza Horizon 5 is the best racing game ever made. It's yeah. it's amazing. Like I play, you know, like the setup with the different seasons where you in a in a kind of time constraint you want to earn enough points to get certain uh limited cars. It's just very smartly designed. Um I think this year for me it belonged to Xbox even if the consumers didn't agree and 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 buy the the machines as much. Are people ever going to freaking buy an Xbox? Do they just give they give so much to the consumers like here take all the game pass stuff here have halo infinite it's the game of the year probably and people are like yeah but i don't actually want yeah. an xbox are you kidding mm -hmm. me yeah. no but the I difference don't... is xbox also i play a lot of third-party games on that machine so with sure. nintendo is i play a lot of nintendo made games on it and so it's a different feel you know yeah. right right no I'm, I'm with you on that and it's 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 tough to i i mean i think i think all the consoles had like they had kind of highs and lows this year i really loved playing ratchet and clank and returnal on my ps5 um like Deathloop was awesome pretty much everywhere resident evil 8 is one of my favorite games of the year like I, it's just fantastic game and you know a, a lot of a lot of third party stuff just doesn't make it to switch but and so when that happens you're you're held up by you know it's a lot of indies are saving the day and a lot mm -hmm. of first party stuff and and cat's right like you know last year i think if you if you weren't like completely crazy for animal crossing then that 
that really did a lot of heavy lifting for Nintendo as a whole that year. Mm -hmm. um, when you look back at our years in review, like if if you loved Animal Crossing, you put hundreds of hours into it. But if you didn't, that was a kind of a kind of a quiet couple That's of months true. for you. You know, That's true, so yeah. I yeah, check. think that the Nintendo Switch is a unique console and continues to be in 2021 reflected that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I'm just going to say that I think 2020, 2022 is hard to say. No, uh, I think it's going to be the best Switch year ever. I think so, too. Yeah. I think so, I too. Agree. Yeah, it's, I, I'm awesome. really confident for that. I think it's going to be awesome. I'm excited for what games we're going to be playing in the future. But now it's time to talk about the games that we've been playing this week. Who's been playing video games? Kat, have you been playing any video games this week on your uh, your old well, Nintendo Switch there? I've been moving, so I haven't had a lot of time to uh, be able to play a lot of games. However, I've been setting up all of my retro consoles, and I was in the oh, nice. office just recently. And shout out to Sam Claiborne, who hooked me with, up with this guy right oh, here. Oh, my God. Oh, right. right. That's yeah. the Pokemon Nintendo 64, for those of you who are yep. listening. Little known fact, Sam Claiborne always has a Pokemon Nintendo 64 on his person at any time, just mm -hmm. in case somebody asks. <laughs> it, yeah, is, it was on his mustache. It was on his desk. <laughs> this thing is wonderful because they just don't make them like this anymore. No. You know? <laughs> Could you imagine a PS5 with a giant like mascot <laughs> <laughs> plastic just popping out like that? And the special Pikachu Nintendo 64 and these colors. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. That, Cap, that console is the maximum overdrive of trucks as a console. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it the Pikachu cheeks light up. It's oh it's like gosh. I didn't see, not Steven, know that. Stephen King could not come up with anything more frightening than that machine. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, he did direct that movie, though, so that was his, one of his it, most frightening things. Oh, it was also very, very good, that movie. Detective uh, Pikachu? I, think... I didn't know he did direct it. Awful. Yes, it's so he directed bad. Yeah, the, it's a great, great ACDC soundtrack, though. So mm -hmm. ah. I picked up the N64 specifically because I was so disappointed with the N64 implementation on the Switch. Yeah. And I was like, I have to play the real thing. I have to play Star Fox 64 on a real N64. So nice. That's what I'm going to be doing over the holidays. Well, nice. 2025, you can get the analog 64. I, I just made that up. I don't know if that's Seth. We it. we we ate pie at the truck stop from uh, Maximum Overdrive. Yes, we correct? did. We Dice did. Arts just... in Bangor, Maine. We did. Wow. We did. We did that together. Wow. There's... Yeah. Just want to point that out. That they, was like, uh, cordoned off was... a whole area just for us to eat pie. That mm -hmm. that truck had a Green Goblin face, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Cause, cause like Steven Spielberg had done Duel, which has the scariest truck ever, right? Mm. Uh, Wage, Wages of Fear has a, has great scary trucks too. But and then Stephen King said, you know what's scarier than a truck that, where you can't see the driver? It's one that has a face. I like Sorry? how Pear just ranked the scariest trucks. In Check movies. out more of right. GN's top ten scariest yeah. trucks in film. There's Sorcerer. <laughs> There's okay, yeah. Sorcerer. Uh, awesome. Everyone should watch that movie. That I, is I, the, a remake of Wages of Fear. All right, keep going. We need to talk about what we've been playing before we talk about sorcerers mm -hmm. and, and trucks. But, uh, right. Pear, what have you been playing? Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon. Ah, oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Nice. I'm look. I'm a big puzzle guy. You saw that, like Grindstone was one of my uh, <laughs> most played games, and it is yeah. still the best puzzle game that you can play on the Switch. You should get it. Um, but this is good. It's 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 hard though, it's, and it's yes. not. A lot of puzzle games can be relaxing where you kind of you look at the play field and you figure out how, what to clear. This game is hectic and it's stressful and it's like it's more, you know, it, it's roguelike style where, you know, when you fail, you got to start over. But you, you keep the things that, um, the, you know, the characters that you have unlocked and, and there are big differences between the different characters. Uh, it, it's really clever. It's, it's a game all, you know, it's about suffering. Like you take damage when you take down your enemies. And so what you want to do is when you wipe out an enemy, you want to make sure that they chain together so that you don't take damage for each one of them. You want to build bigger and bigger chains. And, you know, same with, uh, with healing yourself with with potions when they're chained um yeah it's a it's a really kind of cool expansion on the shovel knight uh concept turned into a puzzle game um it hasn't clicked with me to the degree that something like uh, grindstone has or you know pick cross which i'm actually now trying to finish 
Picross S6 because they just announced Picross S7, which oh is boy. going to be exactly the same as S6, <laughs> S5, S4, S3, going back to the beginning, except they did bring back touchscreen, uh, namely with uh, oh, nice. styl stylus support, right? Like that was something that we loved with uh, Picross uh, 3D on the on the DS. So um, I'm How happy. Many, what do you have about 50 more hours to go before you're, you're finished? Uh, I'm like, I'm three quarters done with oh, S6. Okay. So like 25 um, hours. There, I mean, they, they can, you can, depending on how tired you are, like, I think I played over 100 hours on the last one because I fell asleep so much. Oh. Like, I'm trying to, like, solve one more thing before going to bed, and then it's like, <laughs> I wake up, I'm like, 30 minutes on this puzzle. I don't remember that. Um, but yeah, you can, you can play dozens of hours of, of Picross. It's a good game. I didn't know they, they started having little animations for when you solve the puzzle. I didn't oh, know yeah. the man could chop down the bamboo and stuff. I think I dipped out at um, uh, se season five or whatever. <laughs> oh, you should get the uh, Genesis and Master System one. It's really good. Oh, I should check that one out. I, yeah. I, I, I love Picross, but I'm terrible at it. So I use like hints and everything, and mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Don't judge yeah. me. Well, what have you been playing, Brian? Uh, I, I mean, not a, not a lot on Nintendo. I just finished the campaign for Halo Infinite, um, which mm -hmm. is... Pretty good, I guess. It's fine. <laughs> it's all right. Check that out. Whatever. It's yeah. It's it's, it's fine. But it, no, I I just grabbed um the shovel knight pocket dungeon whatever it's called, and yep. I'm very excited to play that. Is pair? I heard it's like really really hard. Yeah, like, it's, it's very it's very difficult. It's definitely it's, again, yeah. it's not a casual match three game. It is right. much more like a roguelike action game. It mm. is. I, that's one of the games that I've been playing, and I was very surprised because I thought it was just like Shovel Knight Match Three. All right, I'll just sit down and do this. But no, you have to battle uh, the the pieces, and you have to maintain your healing and the items that you have. And certain enemies have certain uh, like defenses that you have to work around in order to solve the puzzle. Mm -hmm. and it's actually, yeah, it is. It is pretty hard. There's a lot of uh, a lot yeah. more action than I was anticipating. And then there are like secret levels that open. Uh, in the middle of matches through like a portal that you go into and then you're like okay now i have to figure out you only have so much space and and items to use to clear the entire thing it's or, or else you just die <laughs> yeah it's you a cool idea so the the what happens in that game is when you first of all time passes and things drop from the sky but if you take a step time speeds up so yes you can go slow with the rhythm but if you go faster more things will drop faster what they did that's really clever like imagine like a game like puyo puyo um where you're trying to clear you know things with the same color in this case like you're not assembling them to match you know three four or whatever you have to attack them like the 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 puzzle blocks have hit points so imagine yeah. there's a puzzle block that has three hit points you have to hit it three times now each time you do that with certain enemies you will take damage and so you have to kind of like keep track of your hit points and then get potions to heal yourself but what's really cool is there's certain enemies like if you attack them from the right they will shield themselves from the right and so then your next attack has to be from the top which means now you have to move one two spots which means one two more drops yeah. will happen so it's, it's it's very smartly designed but it's also very tough and really difficult to keep track of yeah as soon as you figure out one of the levels with all the new enemies and you beat them you go and then like you get a whole new type of enemy like there's ones yep. that not only do they block your next shot then they move across. it's like man yeah yeah so or they poison I mean, you or whatever, uh, you it's, know? yeah it's tough yep. it's it's not what i was expecting i'm enjoying it quite a bit i think i've played like maybe six hours so far mm -hmm. but primarily what i've been playing and this is not a surprise to anyone is loop hero i love oh. loop hero oh. so much i had uh, a game the other day where i happened to have the uh the the perk where you get uh i think 50% more on your ceiling of items that you can take. Plus you draw, I was able to drop off 10% of my collected items per loop. And I got up to 17 loops, which I think Whoa. might be a world record. I don't know if it's a world record <laughs> or not, but uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy intense. And by the, like the 17th loop at the end of it, I said, no friggin' way. Am I going to test my luck with this? But I played a game yesterday where had I had those perks, where I was dropping things off and had a higher ceiling, I probably could have beaten that because I was just, everything was like firing on all cylinders except for those two perks. Man, I absolutely love this game. It is so fun. I don't know if it has a lot of appeal outside of people who are specifically me, but uh, if, if, you like, if you like me and you like games, then you should try this game because I like this game. 
one of the best games released this year, Seth. So yeah, I was playing I, it on. This was one that I actually did play on Steam because I always felt like a game that yeah. I should be playing with mouse and keyboard. But I absolutely love the idea of a uh, kind of a real time strategy turn based RPG kind of thing where you're making decisions yeah. on the fly related to you your build. And as you said, it's really satisfying it when you really get a really is. good build going and you're taking out huge numbers of enemies all at once. There's a real rhyme and the reason to the way that you place the actual buildings. And it feels great when you actually unlock more powerful enemies or find secrets and that kind of thing. It's a yeah. really clever take on the roguelike and dungeon crawling genre. So good. And I'm keep yeah. finding out new things. Like I didn't realize that if you put a vampire house next to your village, I was like, well, I'm not going to do that because then you get a bunch of zombies. But after three loops, that zombie town turns into like a super healer and you get 165 hit points of healing as opposed to like 45, as long as you can make it through, you know, having to fight four zombies and a vampire for the first three times you go through that town. It's a little bit tough, but man, ooh, I love this game. $15 on the eShop. Uh, I highly recommend everyone check it out. We have just a little bit of time left. I am going to do a question block. This is a, a, a from... Carl DeNovio, who actually had last week's question block. This is not technically a question, but I'd like to see each member of the panel make one wish for Nintendo's 2022 and then maybe uh, give it a monkey paw style twist. So, uh, Brian, you're, you're very good at, at, at the twists. So, do you have uh, um, any sort of wishes? Okay. Uh, I, I want a uh, Oracle and Seasons uh, remake for The Legend of Zelda uh, in the same engine that um, Link's Awakening ran in but the uh the monkey paw twist is that the frame rate is even worse now <laughs> no i th I, th I think the monkey paw twist is that they're playable only in labo vr <laughs> <laughs> why would you do that to me that's that was so perfect mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a great one cat do you have a, a monkey paw twist with or a wish uh i would love a valkyrie profile remake but i just know that square enix will do it in like the secret of mana style and i'll just be like uh it's, it's an action game it's 2.5d why did i even bother wishing for this thing so um but yes that is that is one of my fondest wishes my final frontier as it were and it comes with its own cooked in monkey's paw ironic yeah, twist exactly i'm gonna set the stage we get a nintendo direct and I, I made this joke on twitter like years ago but i'm doing it again screen says metroid everyone starts freaking out prime everyone starts losing their mind Federation Force 2 with the monkey paw! <laughs> uh, there it is. Federation Force is underrated. To be oh, fair, on, my, no, we, my kids necessary. absolutely <laughs> loved Metroid Prime Federation Force. They used to play it together all the time. So there is a, I have a soft spot in my heart for that. But that is all the time we have for this year. So forget about it. We'll see you in 2022. Follow us on Twitter at NVC Podcast. Submit your questions to NVC at IGN.com or post or, excuse me, answer the post on the NBC Facebook page. Uh, thanks to Tayo on the ones and twos and Logan behind the scenes. Most of all, thanks to all of you for hanging out with us. Remember, NBC is the only place where you can get, get the, the thing. thing. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Merry Christmas.